are we at? We are on 470 out of, uh, oh, we're almost done. 470 out of, um, Four seventy out of six. Four seventy out of uh, sorry, acknowledgments. So six thirty two is where we end. Four seventy will be done. Let's hit these pages. Hope of lessening the critical nature of the labor problem in industry, except through a scientific study of industrial physiology, including psychology. As O'Connor observed, Mayo's research spoke directly to the core of executive concern. And it revolved around how to calm the workers' irrational agitation prone mind and how to develop a curriculum to train managers and executives to do so. In 1933, Mayo reinforced the point. The problem was not the lack of an able administrative elite, but the elite's lack of understanding the biological of social facts involved in social organization and control. Don Ham saw training this elite as an essential task for the business school, complementing the efficient physical engineering of the ordinary worker by Taylor Mayo offered a psychological revival. Unlike Taylor Mayo, Mayo or Mayo, M A Y O. Also had a story about how he realized this could be done, this time based on a flash of inspiration as he pondered the meaning of experiments with a small group of workers at Western Electric's Hawthorne plant. The research, which had begun well before Mayo joined, was designed to see whether changes in physical conditions such as better illumination made much difference to productivity. In this regard, the most important stage in the experiments involved a group of six women oh, working on a relay assembly. The aim was to ascertain ascertain the impact of rest periods and hours of work. Eventually, it was decided to concern them on a group rather than an individual so that there was a shared bonus for higher productivity. The research found a 30% increase of productivity over two and a half years along with greater work satisfaction. Explanations of exactly why this had happened were uncertain until, as Mayo reported, he had his great in Claire seismic and realized what made the difference was that the researchers were actually showing interest in them. See this? Large conclusion was that psychological conditions were more important than the physical and that workers responded to their own group dynamics and informal social networks. Motivations went beyond self-interest into seeking recognition and security. The recommendation was that management should seek a good working relationship with their staff and that happy workers would be more productive. As with Taylor, the original story was embellished and interpreted with Mayo's own pre-convinced notions. Once again, a simple explanation was offered to make sense of a complex set of facts. In retrospect, the best explanation for the improvements in productivity was a combination of pay incentives in a non-unionized plant and against the background of the depression. 
and the attitudes of individual workers. The replacement of two women who had not joined in the spirit of the experiment by two who did was a turning point. Maya's conclusion was not in itself preposterous. It fit in with theories of fully and encouraging managers to view the workers with more rounded, softer human terms and was widely considered to have encouraged a term for the better in management practice. In this way, the so-called Human Relations School was founded in attending to the informal aspects of the organization and the social conditions of the workplace. Miles' place was assured in the history of industrial sociology. Though were it not for the Hawthorne experiments, he would by now be forgotten. He had exaggerated his own qualifications, including his psychiatric training, and was considered by colleagues to be snobbish, lazy, and uninterested in teaching with only the occasional publication to his name. As we have seen, Miles, Mayo's, Miles underlying philosophy was deeply concerned of seeing conflict as an effect, a social disease to be remedied by healthy cooperation across the supposed divides. By the same token, cooperation among workers for their own ends was unhealthy because he saw politics as aggravating the problem and was generally reluctant to consider the problem of power. Any solution was the responsibility of the administrative elite who must be trained to develop social competence to match their technical competence. In the Hawthorne studies, the claim positive response had been to inadvertently enlighten researchers rather than truly enlighten managers. In the mid-1930s, Mayo made acquaintance with Chester Bernard, president of New Jersey Bell, a cerebral man and a voracious reader with hard experience in industry and practical administration. By 1938, he was giving lectures at Harvard with some rewriting. These were turned into what is now considered to be a seminal text on management about the functions of the executive. Barnard forged an extraordinary bond with the psychologist Lawrence Henderson, a leading figure in the university and a colleague of Mayo's. This was based on the shared interest in the Italian sociologist and notable alias Wilfredo Pareto. Having discovered Pareto in the mid 1920s, Henderson became something of an evangelist in the 1930s, establishing what became known as the Pareto Circle at Harvard. To Henderson's scientific mind, Pareto's notions of social equilibrium struck a chord as well as matched his own conservative inclinations. Although he dominated the circle with a seminar technique that was said to be only freely imitated by a power driver, the group did include people such as Talcott Parsons and George Holmans, among the most influential of their generation of sociologists. It was also a refuge for conservative academics seeking an alternative to Marx and attracted by the underlying treatment of society as an interdependent and largely self-correcting system. Henderson was impressed by Bernard as a man who not only had read Bernard originally in French, but also sought to apply his ideas in the real world.